Hello there, everybody. Welcome to this very special renewal of the Change of Minds podcast. This is me, Owen Fitzpatrick, and this is season four. And I'm very excited. Why? Because it's the first time I know I did uh, some video podcasts before, I think like season two, I experimented about, but now this is the plan moving forward. So you're going to see all of my podcasts are going to be video from now on. Well, the occasional one, I might still do audio, but the overwhelming majority of them are going to be video from here on in. Here on on? Here on in? I think it's here on in. Here on in. Yeah, that sounds fine. You are really, really welcome to be here. I'm very excited because we're going to be talking today about a topic that is very, very close to my heart. I decided to start season four with the title of the area and the field that I'm building and working on at the moment. I want to explain what I call belief leadership, what it is, what it's all about, how it's different to other leadership approaches, how it's different to other things that I've done in my life and in my past, uh, things like NLP, things like coaching, things like psychology, how they all fit together. And I'm open by the end of this session. It's like a session. I'm kind of trying to make it like a session. At the end of this episode, you are going to be enlightened to the power of uh, belief and uh, what belief can do for us. And a lot of this season and a lot of the work that I'll be doing moving forward will be around the power of belief. How do you believe better? How do you create uh, changes in your life by starting with the beliefs and the mindsets that hold you back? There's an awful lot of work out there about mindset. A lot of people are doing some great work, which is obviously a lot of work pioneered by the wonderful Professor Carol Dweck of Stanford University with her fixed and growth mindset. There's great researchers like Aliyah Krum and Kelly McGonigal that are also adding significant value from the research and the work that they've been doing. And what I want to do is not only shine a light on some of these terrific researchers, but also offer you a perspective, which I think is extremely powerful and extremely valuable to help you to be able to take charge of your own brain, take charge of your mind in an even more powerful and effective way. We will be talking today about belief leadership. And I want to start by defining belief leadership and where this came about. So this notion of belief leadership is really based upon the premise that ideas don't often lead to change. It's your belief in an idea that leads to change. So in other words, in order for you to be able to create real change long-term with the kind of people that you're trying to help, you need to be able to get them to believe in the change. So if you're a leader and you need to get a change happening in your organization, well, you need to cultivate belief in that idea. People need to feel a commitment towards it. And that is what's going to lead to consistency. So often we have a million ideas. We've got thought leaders out there with brilliant ideas. But if we don't implement them, then they're not valuable. And so it's crucial is that you learn how to be able to generate conviction in those particular actions so that when people are engaging in them, they bring to the table this strength of belief that allows them to be able to inspire with the work that they do. So belief leadership is something where, to me, I'm trying to help people to be able to master the art of what does it mean to cultivate belief? How do you generate belief? How do you change belief? And we have a, a rich resource of a variety of different techniques from psychology to cognitive behavioral therapy to NLP or neuro-linguistic programming to new areas like street epistemology to deep canvassing. There's a whole host of different approaches that all help you to be able to work with and change beliefs, not just in terms of other people's, but also your own. And so that's an area that I really want to spend a lot more time in. It's what drove me to seek out gurus, which I was lucky enough to meet and chat with in terms of India more than 20 or 20 years ago now this year. It's what drove me to go to South America and spend some time with Shaman there and do some ceremonies in terms of ayahuasca, understanding how psychedelics influence their entire belief system. It's what got me to go to more than 100 countries, including North Korea, to understand what it's like to live in a completely different reality to what we're used to in, in I suppose, the Western world, to go to Afghanistan, to go to Rwanda, to go to Iran, to all of these places that I'd always heard of and I've always been fascinated by because of the way in which we are told in terms of the narratives we're told about what it's like, what these countries are like. And 
all of the lessons I learned along the way helped me to get a really rich understanding as to how beliefs work. And so what I want to do is through this field of belief leadership, help everyone else out there to be able to understand first and foremost, how your own beliefs work. We talk about the neuroscience. We talk about the stories we tell ourselves. We talk about how we formulate beliefs in the first place. We talk about what well, the evolution of beliefs. Why do we evolve to have beliefs as opposed to thoughts? And a, a large part of this comes down to the fact that for me, struggling as I did in my teenage years with depression, it was something that pretty much saved my life. My ability to recognize that I had the ability to change my, not, not my feelings per se, but my beliefs allowed me to see myself and see the world in different ways. Because ultimately speaking for me, my beliefs about the world, my beliefs about myself are the very things that were driving me to want to end my life. And my ability to change those beliefs were the very thing that helped me to see the world differently, believe in the world differently, believe in myself differently. And so those same solutions provided me with a path that I went on 30 years ago. And now I want to share it. 30 years ago is when I sort of really started out on this journey. When I first heard about hypnosis, it's when I first heard about NLP or Neuro Linguistic Programming, and that's the journey. In future podcasts, I'm going to go into the most important influences in my life. I want to let you in behind the curtain to show you a little bit about how I think and why I think the way I think and what I've been through and my experiences so that hopefully you get a richer understanding as to why I'm approaching things the way I am and why I've diverged, I suppose, a little bit from some of the, the, the paths that I've been on beforehand and also why I'm so weird. I mean, I know I'm, I'm a little weird. I'm a little strange. And uh, you know, most, most of my friends think it. Most people in my life think it. I come across as a bit of a weirdo. And not in a bad way, but I've kind of come to accept it. And I think once you accept the freak in you, and I don't mean like freaking as in a dodgy way, but once you accept the freak in you, like that's a word that it used to be bandied around quite a lot when I was younger is freak. And I used to think to myself, oh my goodness, I hate the fact that people are calling me a freak. But now I kind of think, well, there's benefits to freakness. In fact, I think sometimes it's a compliment if someone says, oh, they're freaky. Depends on the tone of voice. Yeah, ever notice people can say words that make you, that should be an insult, but the way they say it, they're like compliment. I mean, freaky is like one of those words. Anyway, I, well, let me get back on track. So belief leadership is that ideas don't need to change. Your belief in the idea needs to change. And in order for us to be able to make long-term consistent changes, one of the most effective ways to do that is by cultivating belief. So how do we do that? Well, in order to do that, once again, all the travels and all the research led me down the path of looking at what happens with regards to propaganda. How does propaganda so successfully affect large populations to believe in particular ideas? Advertising industry, how does that work? And why are they able to create a belief in a particular brand in terms of marketing and advertising? In terms of sales, what is it that the most successful salespeople do? Not in terms of the, you know, transactional or commodity-based selling, but in terms of cultivating the relationships where they get their clients to believe in them and believe in the organization that they work for to the point that they build long-term relationships, sometimes which lead to six or seven or even eight figure relationships, right? Consultancies. What are the kinds of things that consultancies do to be able to generate the massive amount of revenue that they do? All of these are examples of belief at its very best, but probably the, the best kind of examples is my work as a therapist and the work that we do, the work that I used to do, I suppose, when I was a therapist, the work that fellow therapists that I know, some of my colleagues, executive coaches and coaches do every single day, helping people to get out of their own way by getting them to change the beliefs that they have about themselves, about their life, about their work, their team, about their organization and the way it functions so that they can start to think in more useful ways and not just think in more useful ways, believe in more useful ways. When I did my TEDx talk in 2016, one of the lines that I said that resonated with a lot of people was, when you're depressed, you don't think negatively. When you're depressed, you believe negatively. And that's a line that was very, very important for me. In fact, it was one of the very few, there's one or two lines that don't strictly speaking rhyme in that whole thing. If you listen to the whole thing, there's one or two lines that don't exactly rhyme. And that's one of the lines that doesn't rhyme. And it doesn't rhyme because I wanted to repeat that in such a way that it stood out from all of the rest of the poem that I created there. 
when you're depressed, you don't think negatively. When you're depressed, you believe negatively. The reason I wanted to bring that to everyone's attention is because when I was struggling with depression, people would often talk about, well, all you need to do is think differently. You need to change your thinking. So just reframe the situation or talk to yourself in a different way or do this or do that. And everyone had great suggestions, great advice, great recommendations on how I should change my thinking. But that never worked for me, right? It would help, but it wasn't enough for me. What made the difference for me was getting to the place where I learned how to change my beliefs. Because when I was depressed, it wasn't like I had negative thoughts. It was, I was convinced the world was a terrible world. I was convinced that my, my future was hopeless. I was convinced that I was a complete loser and would always be, and that was a bad thing. These were the kinds of things I was convinced about. So I believed in all of these negative ideas. It wasn't just that I was thinking that way. I was convinced of it. And so one of the things I realized is that it's in changing the beliefs that makes the big difference. When I was, when I was able to overcome depression, and again, it's not something that I think, I, 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 I guess I'm still very vigilant against it. If I ever go through a dark patch, I'm very, very aware of that. And I immediately am straight to the beliefs I'm holding. But I think what happens often is that we find ourselves falling into the trap of becoming convinced of the reality that we're in. And in some ways, it's our emotions that trigger this. This is what we call effective realism. It's when you tend to see the world based upon how you feel. So the way the world is, is not how the world is to you. It's how you feel the world is. So your emotions dictate the way in which you filter your experiences. And the way I like to see this is in what I call the difference between core beliefs and emotional beliefs. So core beliefs are the beliefs that are unshakable, right? You believe in this and nothing can shake it. You can have a good day, a bad day, a terrible day, an amazing day, and you still are convinced with that. And a lot of the, what we call knowledge fits into the core belief. We believe in gravity. That's a core belief. And I started asking myself the question, what is it that we can do in order for us to start to believe in ourselves like we believe in gravity? What if you were able to believe in yourself like you believe in gravity? In other words, it didn't matter if you had a terrible day. It didn't matter if everybody in your life told you that they, they hated you. It, it wouldn't matter if you had the worst kind of look. You would still believe in yourself just as strongly. So that's, to me, the core belief that we need to, to look at building. But unfortunately, so much of the way in which we feel about ourselves is what we call emotional beliefs. And these are beliefs that are triggered based on emotion. So when you're depressed, the negative feeling that you experience completely warps the set of beliefs that you have. So you start to see the world in a completely different lens. You're looking at it as if it's a completely different genre of experience. So whenever we feel bad, that bad feeling can often trigger a worldview, a set of beliefs we have about the world, a set of beliefs we have about our own identity, the way in which we think. And based upon that, we fall into this trap. And so what we need to do is we need to be able to learn whatever skills we have that can help us to be able to change that. And so belief leadership to me is helping people to be able to lead change in the world, whether you are a leader of an organization, a leader of a team, or even if you just want to be able to lead your own life in a more successful manner, it's your ability, your capacity to be able to change the beliefs that you hold inside yourself for your life. And this to me is a game changer because so much of what we do, so much of what we studied is based upon the same sets of ideas. If only you use this idea, this is the answer. So you look at all the books behind me and they have the big idea. You watch any TEDx talk, they have a big idea. And the big idea is always, if you do X, this is what it's going to lead to. But in order to do X, you really need to start to believe in X because the belief in X is what gives X, whatever that idea is, the power. It allows you to be able to start to transform the way in which you experience reality because you start to feel driven and motivated to be able to go, how can I make this work? So if we take Simon Sinek's start with why, this notion of inspiring leaders and driving inspiration in, in, in terms of making leaders great, starting with why is a lovely idea. But how do you actually get people to do that? And if you tell them to do it, they might do it once. Maybe they'll do it twice, but it won't necessarily become a habit. If you give them the reasoning as to why it's useful, maybe you'll get a few more. But if you truly want to get most people to actually drive that as a natural way of working, you need to be able to cultivate belief. And so 
what is the difference between belief leadership and other forms of leadership? You've got great forms of leadership, like servant leadership. You've got forms of leadership, which is very much based upon the situational leadership, very much based upon the context or the situation you find yourself in. You've got some great leadership experts out there that propose ways of, you know, building empathy and the importance of strategy and the importance of clarity in your communication. There's lots of great stuff out there. But once again, all of these ideas fall flat unless we have the ability to communicate. Even influential leadership, ironically, if you can't communicate to the people that you need to communicate, that this idea is the one to take and they need to not just comply, but they need to commit, they need to be convinced, then you're going to struggle to be able to get that idea out to the stakeholders that you need to bring it out to. And in your personal life, if you're trying to improve your life by this technique or that technique, well, it'll probably only work so far. Fundamentally, the changes that have happened when I've worked as a therapist or as an executive coach or delivering a training or doing even a keynote speech, when people have come to me and said, my life changed as a result of this moment or that moment, not just with me, with others as well. It was the moment where they changed the beliefs that they had about themselves, about their life. And look, no one's made as many mistakes as me. I mean, I've got a lot of things wrong over the years. I'm far from perfect. I would also say in terms of the area that you're in, you're always going to find yourself struggling against something. For me, it's so often it's trying to convey an approach or an idea when so many people are already convinced. If you take a lot of people in the personal development industry, whether they're into coaching or NLP or different forms of how to help people change, there's an awful lot of conviction in that field, which is why people are so passionate. By the way, belief in something doesn't guarantee competence or effectiveness even. It just guarantees taking the action. In order for you to guarantee competence, that's about ensuring that they've got access to the right kind of training or skills or what. If they just have access to the right kind of training and skills, that doesn't guarantee the work done. And so what we do is we fall back on things like motivation. We try to motivate people to do it. And there's been a few things like um, Mel Robbins talks about the 54321 rule. Motivation is not enough. A lot of people talk about motivation not being enough. Zig Ziglar once said, motivation is like a path. You need to do it every day. So motivation certainly has its place. It's important. But when it comes to it, you need consistency. And consistency is not about consistently having to motivate yourself every single time. Because when you believe in something, you don't have to motivate yourself. If you believe in God, you don't have to motivate yourself to, to go to uh, prayers or to go to church or to, to, to go to a service, right? Or to attend some form of ritualistic experience that you do. If you believe in God, you don't really, you don't really need to be motivated if you believe that it's important to do. It's just part of it. If you believe in what the dentist tells you, the signs of teeth, then you don't have to be motivated to brush your teeth. You don't have to go, oh, imagine if I don't brush my, imagine if I do. You just brush your teeth. It's a discipline. It's something that you naturally do because you believe that it's important for you to do. So even our values, our priorities, our beliefs about what's important. So all of this is to say the beliefs to me are the answer to so many questions. They're so crucial. They're so critical. And what makes this different is that we're not like saying, this is how you need to lead per se. We're saying, this is how you need to lead minds. This is how you need to be able to change the way people think so that they come with you with all of these great ideas that you want to put forward. You're trying to do change management. You need to cultivate belief in that change. If you do, they're going to change. If you don't, they're not. So belief drives behavior. And also, as I sometimes talk about, behavior can help to drive beliefs. But in a moment, before I get to the framework. It's called the scaled framework that I've built to be able to really tick all the boxes of what it takes to be able to transform someone's beliefs or to cultivate belief in something. Before I get to that, let's talk a little about the difference between belief leadership and other things that I've done in the past. So I've spent a lot of my life studying. Well, first of all, hypnosis was the first thing that I began to study. And I studied that. I became a qualified hypnotherapist and psychotherapist. Hypnoanalysis, actually, but obviously that incorporated suggestion hypnosis as well. So I learned, you know, how to be able to bring people into a trance, how to be able to access or communicate with the subconscious or the unconscious, as we like to refer to it, and to help people to 
inverted commas, reprogram themselves through self-hypnosis or help us to be able to deliver suggestions to people to help them to change the natural ways in which they're thinking. So I started off with hypnosis, which is a, a great tool. And then I learned NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming. And this was at the same time as I was studying psychology. So with NLP, neuro stands for the brain and the mind. Linguistic is language or communication. And programming is our ability to be able to change the way in which we think and change the way in which we work. And NLP is wonderful. And it's a wonderful attitude and methodology that leads behind a trail of techniques, as Dr. Richard Bandler would say. I came across that in the, the 1990s, got to know uh, Dr. Richard Bandler and got to write a number of books with him. We've worked on seven books together, six of them we've written together and one I edited with him and learned a massive amount over those years and, you know, contributed ideas to NLP in the field and stuff like that through the work that we've done. But to me, he's, he was the genius that I was very fortunate to be mentored. And I'll, I'll talk more in a future episode about that, but I learned a massive amount from working with Richard and also some other NLPers that were around at the time, but Certainly Richard was my greatest influence and a large part of that was connected to beliefs. So Richard obviously has a, a belief change technique that he's talking about for many years to do it. The way in which we construct beliefs inside our mind, what, what we refer to in NLP as submodalities. So these are the qualities or components of a thought and certain thoughts are represented differently than others. So when you have a belief, you represent it differently to just an idea. And so there's some great stuff there. Primarily, the stuff that influenced me the most in terms of NLP was the work on the meta model, which is a set of questions that allow you to be able to specify information, clarify information by doing so, open up the world and get you to see things in a different way. With that, if you look at what the meta model is all about, it really was primarily at least used in terms of therapy. And in fact, recently, over the last few months, early 2023, we came out with a, a revised version of the original book that Dr. Richard Bandler wrote with John Grinder, which was the structure of magic. It was the very first book written in terms of NLP. It was ma uh, Richard's master's thesis at the time. And so myself and Richard took that book, revamped it, updated it, applied it to problem solving instead of therapy, gave lots of different examples. I added a, a bit of my own experiences around problem solving. And that book's now available. It's out there. I think it's on Amazon or one. It's called Patterns for Problem Solving. In the work of doing that's been an area that I've been very interested in, uh, which is the meta model and another form of another element or aspect of NLP called slide the mouth patterns. And those kind of linguistic patterns of how to help people to change the way they think about the world, to change their fundamental beliefs. These are the kind of elements that I got from NLP. NLP is great for changing your state and great for influencing people. The Milton model is a great language tool to be able to influence people more effectively. So certainly I've been very much influenced by NLP, but there's also an awful lot of other things that I've spent time researching. I got into obviously studying psychology up to a master's thesis. I went deep in terms of social psychology. What are all the different things, not just Cialdini, but all the different models in terms of motivation, all of the different insights we, we have in terms of what makes people change minds. How does propaganda work? For example, how did brainwashing work? How does cult programming work? I looked into all of those, trying to understand what are all the things that allow us to get a better sense as to how everything works. And I've been doing that since the late 1990s, right? Studying everything that I could get my hands on in terms of that. And so what I extracted, and again, there's so many different things, but what I extracted are, are some of the ideas that feed into this notion of belief leadership, the, this scale framework that I'll uh, introduce to you in a moment. But belief leadership is different to hypnosis, it's different to NLP, it's different to coaching, it's different to cognitive behavioral therapy, it's different to even some of the newer approaches, which I've only learned about in the last few years, called street epistemology, which is really involving conversations to try to understand why people believe what they believe. Very much influenced, I think, by that Socratic method based on Socrates' work, where he would ask brilliant questions to get you to realize that you don't know as much as you think, or deep canvassing, which was used in, in politics to be able to change certain social views and to be able to get votes for certain social policies and ideas. And once again, remarkably, there's a number of patterns, a number of similarities. And in a world so polarized where we, we seem to be so divided upon so many things, I was also fascinated with, well, how's the internet influenced this? Why is it that we're so polarized more now than we ever have before? And once again, 
I, I tried to understand as much as I could about that and read everything I get my hands on to try to understand where are we now. And the final thing I'll say before I get into the scaled framework is, and I'm going to be diving more into this over future episodes. So I'm excited to spend more time in your ear, not literally in your ear, but you know what I'm saying, as we continue. But as we go forward, I want to get a little bit more into all these areas. But certainly we've been very much influenced by the advent of social media, the experience we have in terms of even COVID and during that and how politics became so tribalized and whatnot. There's extreme views on the left and the right that seems to be louder than ever. Once again, I did whatever I could to try to understand what's going on so that I could explain it in a sense of how does that help us? How does that help us with our own mind? How does it help us helping other people with their minds too? And that's really what belief leadership is designed to do. And the other thing that I'm also aware of, which I'll lastly say is the emergence of AI uh, quite recently, things like ChatGPT, which is be talked about all over the place currently, but it really shows us now there's been a big step up in terms of what artificial intelligence can do. And to me, it makes belief leadership so much more important than it even was before that. And I'll tell you why. We now have easier access to information that we've ever had before. We can find out anything we want. If you, not only, we, we had Google before, which is still amazing, but now we have ChatGPT. We can literally ask it for information about anything we want. And it will tell us, it will give us information. Not always accurate, sometimes it bullshits a bit, to be honest. But the majority of the time, it's really great. And if we know how to ask the right questions, which is something I've been spending a lot of time learning, it can give us incredible and wonderfully valuable answers. But just having the ideas, just knowing the answers, understanding the facts, not enough. We have to be able to cultivate belief in them. And that's something that AI currently can't do. Why? Because what it's great for is helping us understand what's going on. It's not so great to be able to get us to be convinced about how it works. And so that's what makes me really excited about this whole endeavor of belief leadership. So what is the scaled framework and what are the most important elements of belief leadership? Well, it's scaled because each letter stands for a word. It's an acronym. And the S stands for stories. And that is one of the most important elements that we need to pay attention to is the stories that we tell ourselves about the world, the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves, the stories we tell ourselves about what's going on in our life. And I spent a lot of time studying screenwriting and storytelling. I spent so much time going to all of the courses multiple times with the, the, the wonderful genius himself, Robert McKee, who is, has taught more Oscar winners than anyone else out there in the field. He's an incredible man and learned so much about how storytelling works and why we believe the stories that we tell ourselves. And so I'm going to share, in terms of belief leadership, share why stories make such a difference and how stories and beliefs are related and connected and why we need to understand how to cultivate stories because they're one of the internal elements that influence the way in which we think. The C of scale stands for community or culture. And this is really who we surround ourselves with. If you ever look at some of the tribal attitudes that now exist in the, the political landscape we find ourselves in, well, a lot of times those tribal relationships have led to the convictions that a lot of people have because they're surrounded by people that also believe what they believe. And when you are surrounded by people that confirm your beliefs, you become even more certain of them. And that's problematic. So in order for you to be able to get to the point where you're successfully building the kind of belief that you want, you need to be able to give yourself access to other people that share the same kind of belief. You need to find yourself a community that believes in it because we are very much influenced by each other. And we're very much influenced by the culture that we're in as well as the community that we're in. So whenever you're trying to cultivate belief or change belief, you need to always be paying attention to the people you're surrounding yourself. The third approach or the third aspect or element rather of the scale framework is actions. And this is really the actions or habits that you engage on a consistent basis. It's not just that beliefs drive behaviors, it's that behaviors drive beliefs. And the more that you take the actions or engage in the behaviors or engage in the habits that are aligned with the belief you want to have, this reduces what we call cognitive dissonance, which is the psychological concept describing what happens when our beliefs are out of touch, let's say, with our actions. 
and either our beliefs will change or our actions will fit to change your beliefs. So when you change your actions, you're making it easier for you to start to see yourself as that kind of person. And so it's important for you to be able to identify what are the actions that you would need to take for you to start to become convinced in that particular idea, or even what are the kind of actions you would need to take to believe in yourself more, if that's who you're trying to believe in. The fourth element of the scale framework is the L, and that stands for logic or logical appeal. And this is, re this is really what most people go first to. It's like, in order for me to convince you about something, in order for me to convince you to believe in something, I'll give you the evidence. I'll tell you, this is why you should believe this. These are the answers that you need to know. So I'll walk you through the reasoning. I'll walk you through the evidence. I'll walk you through the science. I'll walk you through the statistics. And I'll use that. And that is important. Being able to get all of your numbers right, especially in the business world, being able to showcase that you have the evidence to back up your claims is crucial. Showing the data or the data, depending on where you're from in the world, is important. You need to be able to show people that this is legitimate. This is logical. This is reasonable. This is something that we've worked on and thought through. And that's important and you need to have that. So you need to cultivate uh, a strong understanding of what the reasoning is behind this belief that you're trying to build. But the next letter, E, stands for emotion or emotional appeal. And this is because you also need to ensure that the feelings that you're feeling give you the kind of experience that you need. In other words, just like I said at the beginning, when you're depressed, you don't think negatively. When you're depressed, you believe negatively. The emotion itself, the feeling itself can drive a whole set of behaviors and beliefs. It can drive immediately a, a way of thinking about the world. And so when we tell our stories, one of the challenges we have to realize is that the stories you tell yourself aren't necessarily consistent all the way through. You've got the core beliefs, which are probably linked to core stories, right? So the story is something that almost builds out the belief. So stories influence our beliefs and our beliefs influence our stories that we tell ourselves. But it's also the emotions that we feel can often trigger different stories. So something bad happens to you and you get let down and all of a sudden that feeling brings you into a, a really dark place where you start to tell yourself a story how you're not good enough and this is an old story that you've told yourself before. But as long as you're living in that story, you're living with a set of beliefs that are enmeshed inside of that story. And therefore, you're going down a rabbit hole of a dark way of seeing the world at that moment in time. So you need to be aware of what are the emotions that you need to feel and how can you both extract the belief so it becomes a core belief, not an emotional belief, but also how can you create the right kind of emotions that are conducive towards you believing in what it is that you want. And then finally, the D is drive or desire. It's the motivation. It is the thing that makes it so that so many of our beliefs stand strong. What's weird about belief and, and the power of belief is that so many of our beliefs, because we want to believe them, right? Now, now we don't think of it that way. We think that we have all the evidence. Confirmation bias, a phenomenon where we look for evidence to prove that we're right and we dismiss evidence that contradicts us, means that we look for evidence to prove that we're correct because we want to be correct. We want to be right. And that desire or that drive that we have, that motivation we have for us to believe in that idea means that we try to make ourselves correct. And so we need to motivate people to believe in something. There's even a field called motivational reasoning or motivational interviewing, where what your job is, is to try to get them to be able to change the direction in which they're thinking. When you can motivate people to want to believe in something, they're much more likely to believe in it. And that's the crazy thing is sometimes motivation is even more important to getting people to believe in something than logic is. And now motivation itself, what we often think is we think, oh, we'll motivate them to take the action, but actually we should try to be motivating them to believe in the idea. And that in turn will help them to take the action in a much more effective, much more powerful way. So all of this is just, I'm just scratching the surface, but I wanted to give you an overlay because a lot of times people hear me talk about beliefs and they think, oh, Owen's probably going to be talking about some NLP stuff, or Owen's going to be talking about cognitive behavioral, Owen's going to be talking about this. And I wanted to share that the, the field that I've been building and the work that I've been doing is not just about one approach. It's trying to combine all of these incredible approaches. And of course, like ever, we always stand on the shoulders of giants, right? Genius is like Dr. Richard Bandler. You know, genius is like Robert McKee, like these great experts. There's so many wonderful experts out there in the field 
like I mentioned already in terms of mindset, well, Carol Dweck, Professor Carol Dweck and uh, Leah Crum and, and Kelly McGonigal. You have Lisa Feldman Barrett, a wonderful neuroscientist. You have Andrew Huberman doing great work. You have Jane Clear doing great work around change, around habits. You've got uh, Mark Manson doing a lot of innovative work in terms of his approach. Like there's so much great stuff out there. And then there's the, the philosophers of yesteryear. There's the Socrates and the Plato and the Aristotle that we have a massive amount of information about. But we have the Stoics, right? Which is a really a philosophy of how to get through life and how Stoicism connects with CBT and even mindfulness that we have now. We have the mindfulness of the, the spiritual approach, which is staying in the present. And then we have the mindfulness of Professor Alan Langer, a psychologist that came up with the term mindfulness in the 1970s, which is, again, around the same time that it became popularized by the work of John Kabat-Zinn. What I'm trying to say is, is all of these different things. And instead of me saying, you know, this is the approach, it's all about mindfulness. It's all about transcendental meditation. It's all about NLP. It's all about coaching. To me, I want to look at everything. And that's what I plan to do, what I've done in, to, to some extent in the podcast. But what I plan to do is, how can I take as much from all the different areas and make it work for you? How can we take the practical insights, not get caught into the, you know, acolytes or the cultish fever that can be apparent in so many of these philosophies and approaches. And instead of people being obsessed about it, how can we bring them together in such a way that's applicable and that can be useful? And so instead of getting people excited about one approach, I decided to get people excited about my own approach called belief leadership. <laughs> I'm realizing the irony. But to me, belief leadership is not a, it's not an approach that I'm hoping everyone becomes obsessed with and uses as, as, as something where they argue about it and go back and forth on it. It's simply a collection of more than 30 years of me starting out as a teenager where I struggled with my mind big time to the point that I wanted to die and how I learned so much by being able to to work on myself, to be lucky enough to be mentored by incredible, incredible people over the years, which I'll, I'll talk about in a future episode, and to be able to learn how to change my mind. And changing minds is about changing minds. But the thing is, it's not that I change another person's mind, it's that I can help cultivate the experience for them so that they change their own mind. And that's ultimately speaking what changing minds is about, I and mean, it's what belief leadership's about. So I hope I gave you some insight I know we covered quite a lot in this, but I hope I gave you some insight as to what belief leadership is all about. This is a bit of a fat episode, but I'm hoping that it, it is something that has kept your attention, you're interested, and you're excited about what's to come. We have some great episodes lined up. We're going to have some guests. It's going to be every Monday. I really hope that you can tune in. It'll be from now on on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. But for now, take care, be well, and may the force be with you. And May you always remember to believe better. Bye for now.